Dwayne, let's do it. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks, Jaunty. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, bloody hell, this is this is all exciting. Stuff. A lot Thank of people looking forward to this podcast. A lot yeah. of our friends. Really? Anyone, anyone say anything to you? Um, no, honestly, it's all been uh, quite quiet and stuff like that. So <laughs> I've just sort of been, I guess, just waiting for this to happen. And I was just like, oh, is this going to happen? Is this podcast going to... So it's going to be happening. And then you've been pressuring me, being like, yeah, James, can you can you come on? I'm like, oh, High yeah, expectations, sure. high expectations, James. <laughs> okay, well, no pressure then on me trying to entertain people and stuff like that. <laughs> Have you ever been uh, on a podcast before? No, this is my first one. Um, like, I've listened to a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. And I've done, like, you know, I've done all sorts of things with microphones. I've done voice acting and stuff like that. But for a, a podcast like this, like, no. <laughs> What's something that you ex- attract to about podcasts? Um, the exchange of information and stuff like that. Mm. And the guests. And what, you, you what know. podcasts do you listen to? Just a bit of everything? Or? Um, a lot of things. Uh, Joe Rogan. Um, I listen to audiobooks. Um, I listen to H3H3 sometimes. Uh, it really depends on the mood I'm feeling. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's... Just something I like to put on while doing, you know, things around the house or when I'm doing, like, my art or animating or stuff like that. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. Well, I guess to give people a context, we've been friends for, like, what, three years now? We've been in college and... This is my fourth year, so we've been friends for, like, four years. Four years now. And we met in our first year. We lived on the same floor at college. Mm. We've done heaps of rain. Often Um, we were neighbours. I remember, what was it, last year uh, that we were, like, rooms right next to each other and stuff like that. Yeah. And even during the first year, oh, well, you were down the hall a little bit more. But it was such yeah. tightly knit, like, you know, first floor and everything like that. Yeah. One. First year of a rain was really, was really good. Um, we had, I had a lot of good friends there. We had Dave Ty, Jeremy, um, Declan, uh, what was it, Kabir? Yeah. Yeah, Kabir was there. That was, that was a good yeah. first year. <laughs> we also, um... Had Kevin as well when we uh, did a walk adventure. A lot of these people, no one on the podcast listening to would know about. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure they'll be very entertained to learn about these people. Okay. All right. So, I mean, what was interesting, though, is when we first went to college, I was one of the only people studying film mm. at Varane. Yeah. But then I met you. And yes. you were doing like a very similar, not sim- like a little bit similar, media course, right? Yeah. Doing like animation, design. So, you know, I feel like that's what kind of got us a bit closer as well to chat with each other and yeah. get to know each other a bit more, eh? Yeah, that's right. Um, so you were doing media at yeah, uh, UNSW. Yeah. And I was doing media arts at the painting campus of UNSW. And um, that is like, that encompasses like a whole load of things. But in uh, media arts, you can pick like a major that you focus on. Mm. So a path. And my pathway that I picked... Uh, was animation mm. because I'm very much interested in that sort of thing. I'm very much interested in film and in drawing. So naturally, those two things just came together, and so that's why I picked uh, media arts and I then picked uh, the animation path. Um, I have finished that degree now, um, but yeah, it was something that we both uh, had a lot in common with then because we both liked film and we therefore both had a you know, a similarity with speaking about the cinematography and stuff like Mm. that and directing. Uh, We both have interests there as well. So, yeah, we just had a lot in common. And because of that, um, I think we've uh, managed to stay good friends because of it. Yeah. Can maybe, can you take it back actually a little bit then? Sure. To why did you get into design or art? You know, how did you know you wanted to get into like graphic design and animation and stuff like that? Okay, so we've all grew up watching Disney. Um, We all grew up watching that stuff. We all played video games when we were kids. And a lot of that stuff is done by, like a lot of the graphics and visuals that you see are done by animators. Mm -hmm. Or like people are part of that process. Like, you know, background artists and sound designers and all sorts of things are a part of that process. So, and I was always interested in drawing as a kid, but um, around some time in like, um, about the end of primary school, so in year six, and then the beginning of high school, I sort of dropped off the arts a little bit. Um, but then uh, it picked back up again. Um, I started getting very much interested in cartoons. Um, I became very much a big fan of My Little Pony, uh, Friendship is Magic. I watched that show quite a bit. And that show actually uh, inspired me again to pick up drawing uh, because it was a 2D animated film made in Flash. Like, I had, I had used Flash before in, like, year seven of high school, and I made, like, a really crap-like banner 
of like these images just moving across. Just use a simple tween of a bomb here, moves across, goes here. So I was automatically just very much impressed by what I was seeing. <laughs> like I was only in year eight as well, so I was like, oh, this is adorable. So that inspired me to actually look more into animation because I was like, I'm now very interested in film and I'm very much interested in drawing. So how can I, you know, merge those two together? So what I ended up doing was I ended up looking a lot of videos about animation from my interest in being a brony. And it just sort of spiraled out of control from there. Um, when you said brony, what is a brony? It's just a fan of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, you know. Can you explain a little bit to My Little Pony, like, you know, situation? Because, I don't know, of all the people, even me, when I first heard about this My Little Pony, he came into my room, and he was talking about My Little Pony, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, isn't this for little girls? Like, isn't this for just kids? And then you showed me this video. Yeah. I don't, I will never forget this video of, like, grown men, mm. like, grown men who have, like, wives and proper jobs at these conferences in in America. Yeah. And they, they were just in circles dancing and going crazy for My Little Pony. Uh, I... Yeah, so... With, <laughs> <laughs> with the craze, um, it's just a, it's just sort of a weird thing that's just sort of exploded um, on the internet in around 2000s. Um, so they're calling this decade the, the new golden age of TV animation. And... Shows like Regular Show, Adventure Time, and My Little Pony, all those things like kicked off in around the 2010s. And because of that, animation has basically been uh, revitalized. Um, had a bit of a dead period where the only thing that was good on was like Avatar The Last Airbender. Why was there a dead period? Uh, it was, it's just, you know, you know how it is. Industries sort of go through phases of things, you mm. know, like um, they're tr it's trying to find a new footing again. Sometimes they're, you know, reluctant to let go of things that they're doing. There was a lot of low random humor uh, around at the time. And so it was just a bit of a bit of a brain dead sort of area. Mm. But what happened was that new animators who were inspired by things like Avatar or who were inspired by other previous shows, like a lot of action shows like Gargoyles or like X-Men, sort of came forward and were like, okay, I want to make my own show with, you know, um, with bad guys and villains. I want to tell overarching stories and stuff like that. Mm. So that's what ended up happening with regular show Adventure Time and My Little Pony. These things came onto the scene and suddenly it just revitalized the whole, the whole uh, scene again. Um, everyone was starting to really enjoy these shows. With My Little Pony, um, it was just found that show just catered to all audiences that watched it. It had um, all sorts of good writing everywhere, very good characters, very relatable, and, you know, good heartfelt messages. I think a lot of people were very sad around <laughs> that sort of you know, time period. So people just were attracted to the bright colors and, you know, the, the good writing and the characters. And so, yeah, the community sort of spawned around that. Um, and it came a bit of a phenomenon. It's died down a little bit now, but it's... Uh, and the series has actually ended. Um, all, all those series have ended. Adventure Time, Regular Show, My Little Pony, they're, they're finishing. Um, and now Steven Universe is still soon to join them. Mm. So I've been a part of, like, you know, not just being a brony, but also just being a part of the animation community in general now. I've sort of bro uh, brought in my horizons. I'm looking at everything. I'm watching all sorts of things. And I'm just, you know, I'm really happy to be studying animation because it's such, it's such a magical thing to see, isn't it? Like, you know, when you watch a good animated film, aren't you just like impressed with what you see? Aren't you like, wow, that's, that's like, that's magic, right? And it, it's, Definitely. and it's sort of this strange situation where animation is, it's seen as like, it's called the animation, like sort of ghetto, where it's seen as a children's main media. And, but animation's for everyone, you know? It's for adults, it's for all sorts of people. Like, if you look at Adult Swim, you can see all sorts of adult animations. If you oh go to boy. Netflix, have you seen, like, Final Space or something? Like, that's there, <laughs> and you can there, watch there's that. There's a lot of, yeah, when you actually look up the stuff, there's a lot of pretty dark animations out there, as well as as fun. Especially in the animals. anime community. There's all sorts of weird and wacky things you'll find over there. All sorts of, from, like, the edgy sort of things. All the way to like very humorous. Maybe there's so, maybe yeah. there's a lot more happy and kids animations because that's just the mass market in a way, right? It's just what, what the market way. has evolved itself in. Yeah. It's just what it's found itself in because of it. You know how markets are to change, right? It's kind of reluctant because it's a risk. So what you find is that today's audience for animation are a lot of people like me who have grown up with these shows mm. in like you know their childhood and have continued enjoying them all the way to adulthood. Whereas I feel like there's a, like the main market, like the, the average Joe, 
probably isn't that interested in animation itself as like a medium or an art form. Mm. And so therefore they're, um, they see it as just, you know, a, a child fodder, you know, just something to put on to distract your baby while they go uh, do their work or something like that. So it's called the animation ghetto because it's stuck in this ghetto and it's trying to get out and trying to appeal to a wide range of people. And I feel like we're seeing a shift right now today. I mean, don't you? We've got things like Rick and Morty and stuff like that. Those are like having a big impact on the pop yeah. culture scene. Um, and also just animation in general in like live action stuff. Like it's there. Like people, I guess, are sort of getting used to it because, you know, you watch it in any sort of Marvel or superhero film. Animation is there as well. Like, how do you think Iron Man's moving, you know? <laughs> That's animated. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like um, animation has become a big part of my life and it's going to continue being a big part of my life and I want to contribute to it by working in that field. So, Speaking yeah. of live action, mm. we, well, yeah, you helped me work on our first, or well, my first at least, uh, CGI short short film in a way I did for Show Real for Rachel. Yes, that thing, uh, Alien Arm. Uh, did it, Alien is that its Arm. official title? By it the is way? its official title. Alien Arm. Wow. Alien Arm. <laughs> it's out there now. People are watching it. I recommend go watch it as well and then come back to the podcast and just so you get an idea of what we're going to talk about next. Will there be a link in the doobly doo? <laughs> there'll be a link. There'll be a link to James Delaney's face. There'll be a link to our alien arm. Um, just yeah, you know, maybe a link to just a time lapse of you working till five a.m. for like three weeks in a row, man. Oh, in your room. Yeah, that was that was a magical time doing that. Um, so I remember that, and you, I remember you messaging me. It was, I was I was currently having my lunch, and you're like, James, I need someone to help me with CGI for yeah a girl's like arm because she's got like her arms like possessed by this alien. And I was like. Oh, hell. But even I'm, before that, man, yeah. you've always helped me out in so many scenes and shorts we've done over the years. Yeah. Going back to just all, like, the Warane short films. Yeah, but, like, this was different. This was like, okay, different. James, I want some animation. Some yeah, exactly. animation. In the been, past, I've yeah. got you to do just, like, um, Jack of all trades things. You've been a gaffer for me. You've been a boom up for me. You've, you know, it, me, and, me and Sherman coined the, tame, coined the term... We need a Delaney on yeah. the scene because Delaney was someone that just can do everything, right? Yeah, right. Someone, it felt it felt like I trained you, or you trained yourself, and just doing multiple like things on set. If you needed a job, you just need an extra pair of hands. I was the person but, to always do yeah. it. Yeah, I knew you were studying animation. I knew that's what you were getting into, and you showed me video work, and I'm like, damn. I'm gonna get in one day, like you know. Hopefully, mm. there'll be a project that comes on soon that there will be something that's obviously not absorbently bad a card or yeah. like you know out of out of our depths but something and i'm like okay so i need an alien arm i need just something to move a little bit yeah right? this is super easy with delaney he showed me he's on piece of cake all right so that's why i messaged you yeah yeah gonna... so you messaged me and i was like oh hell i've never like what's this gonna entail these are some of these skills i probably have never used before so i was just like you know this would probably be good for me so I just typed back, yeah, sure, I'll help because, you know, might as well take opportunities and grip them with both hands when they come so. your way. So we did that. I got, I became a part of the project. I talked to you about concepts. We had all sorts of different concepts. We had like the idea of like some bunch of eyes, like sort of zipping around our arm or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there were a bunch. Yeah, we had like a number, like you showed me an image of someone just having like a number under the skin. Yeah, and... that movie um, In Time or Time with Jack Justin Timberlake. Mm. That's what I was taking inspiration from a little bit. Yeah, right. So we went through a whole bunch of concepts. So and then film day arrived. I helped with that. Mm. Um, so I helped with all of Rachel's like showreel. And we still really had no idea how the alien art would really look. No. Um, but it, yeah. So we kind of just had to wing it on the set of how we were going to do things. Because I know there were a bunch of different ways. Because we weren't. I mean, you know, I watched like VFX artists reacts and like Corridor Crew and stuff like that. Yeah. You've heard of them, and I guess I wanted to think I had a decent idea on how to film for CGI. Yeah. Um, and that's what like, I was kind of asking you, and I didn't even know myself. Do I? Should we green out the arm? Should we black it out? Should we add some practical lighting on it? Okay. And yeah, yeah. we went with the idea where it's like, no, we should actually just do nothing. That I mean, would probably be the best. I mean, the honest opinion was I also had like very little experience in this sort of area, so I was mm. just like, you know, it's probably gonna be a big learning process once we get to the computer. But for now, um, what ended up happening was we were cut very short for time. So we had to get the film done, like, really lickety-split. So 
because of that, there wasn't really much of a, a, a chance to really think about the VFX too much, and I didn't want to pressure you. You seemed like you were very busy on that day. Mm. So it's just like, okay, just, just get it done. I'll, yeah. I'll continue holding the light in the little corner like this and get very exhausted from standing there oh, for like yeah. 30 minutes. One and, of these lights, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of these lights, actually. And yeah, so we just, we just got the sh uh, film done. We just got everything shot. And then it wasn't until about, what, like a couple of months later that we yeah. finally got onto the computer. Yeah. And then, yeah, we started writing into, okay, what is this actually going to look like? And we had to adapt yeah. from what we had. And um, because of it, you know, like, um, the effect looks, I guess, uh, a little, you know, a little cheap. But it's it's what we had to do, right? Yeah. Um, well, I remember... <laughs> Um, I did the cut, like the edit, the rough cut of it, because mm. um, I thought, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't VFX every shot. You know, just use this VFX the final film we're gonna use, like the shots. Yeah, right. So you're waiting for me to do it, and I did it, and then yeah, I, was I, remember, waiting. I remember Rachel um, wanted the. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted it like she wanted three months ago <laughs> well i know and then we was like you know and you said you said oh it'll take me a day <laughs> you said it'll take, so I'm like, it'll take me a day johnny okay. don't worry it'll be fine i'll pull I it on it. <laughs> okay we'll have it out by thursday delane's working on a wednesday i yeah. gave it to you tuesday like all good and i remember i'm um, at at the studio i'm at work yep. and i'm just getting a message on my phone saying johnny this is a little bit trickier than I thought. Yeah, yeah. And then I got like this frazzled EMS going, John T, I'm losing my mind. Yeah, I was. Okay, so... I was like stressed. I was like panicking for you. Okay, so the um, the thing about... The most difficult thing about that whole film was the rotoscoping. I know. Sorry, so, sorry. I just, I just love that you said it would take you a day. I know. It was, I was done a month later. Okay, so... Here I was thinking, okay, you know, I could just get some simple, like, basic circular masks around her arm, lickety split, no problem, the computer will figure it out. No, that's not how this works at all. You have to get out a paintbrush and paint her arm in every single frame that that effect is all happening. So, and because I was new to it, it just kept crashing or, like, you know, I didn't really understand what I was doing. So there was a lot of, oh, is that working? There was a lot of experimentation. And then there was also a lot of waiting. Uh, my computer only had like 16 gigabytes of RAM. Damn. When you need, like, I honestly think, if you're going to use After Effects, you need like 32 gigabytes of RAM. Um, because otherwise the computer just freezes. So, you know, you're painting away, you're painting over her arm and stuff like that. But then the computer, just like every time you, you paint, it gets like, you know, a millisecond longer. Add up like hundreds of frames, suddenly, you know, you're waiting there for minutes after just doing one button click. You have no idea how maddening that is to work like that, you know? <laughs> it is, it drove me insane. So that night I slept very little and uh, I think like, what happened? Did you come and visit me? I came by and yeah. I saw there was like- Hardly anything <laughs> done. <laughs> you had like key framing for the first shot, like half the half the first shot. Mm. And you were try and you know what? You were explaining to me and it was good. You explained to me why it was so difficult yeah and you know it was mine as well i didn't realize just now now we know like, yeah in terms of you have a moving camera if it's handheld compared to like a static shot yeah. it's so much more that's why i see so many tv shows and i understand this now yeah like you know low budget tv shows or have it just on a when just on a tripod and they yeah. do like their um bfx shot yeah they're like blocked off on a tripod yeah whereas ours is um well in the end it's very good but in the end it's like very hard for you because it's like handheld, it's like gritty. It's yeah. like, not handheld, but the glycan's moving, right? It's bouncing yeah. up and down. You yeah. have like a lot of- On, uh, on any shots with the mirror, where they had that little you know interface pop up and mm. she would look at it, um, that really should have been on a tripod. Like it should have been on a tripod because you can see it, it's all wobbling all over the place. And there was nothing that I could really like in the environment that I could pick out mm. that the computer could like latch onto for like auto tracing. Mm. So for, you know, if I wanted, because uh, it's just a square imposed on a mirror, mm. I would just like, okay, I've got these two points up top and these two points on the bottom. All we had to do when we were filming that day was put like little bits of blue tack or some stickers, mm. you know, make it, make it, you know, feminine and stuff like that. She likes to decorate her mirror. And they're like, I could like track those and that would have made the shot so much easier. As it was, I had to do every single frame by hand and I had to like figure out the difference between each shot. And let me tell you, it just doesn't work. There's so many minuscule things that happens when you're hand holding something you have no idea how much someone shakes until you try and do or like you know 
try and do some auto tracing in After Effects, and you can see the computer wobbling with like you know mm. with the keyframes and stuff like that. It's like oh, it's going up and down and everywhere, but it doesn't look like that to our eye because we just don't notice it. But well, that was why I kind of <sighs> I mean, looking back on it, reflecting on it, that was mm. kind of something I really enjoyed the process in terms of there was so much that you and me didn't know about it, and yeah. I guess to literally on like practically on field doing mm. it. I feel like you learn so much of just about VFX in general yeah. than you do just like watching or reading a textbook, right? Yeah, you can't absorb the stuff through osmosis. Like I've read a lot of animation books. You have to do it. Um, you can't just read about it. You can read about it and watch videos about it as much as you like, but if you're gonna, if you want to do something, yeah, you do it. You don't sit on your ass and watch YouTube videos for like you know the rest of your life. You dive in and you get it done. So when it came to this film. It was just, <laughs> it was a nightmare <laughs> of like sitting down, looking at videos, testing things. Eventually we got a process down. Mm. And I remember like, you know, looking back at the very last day when I was finishing this, I was painting away as fast as lightning. I was getting this done way faster than when I first started. It was such an interesting, such an interesting thing to look back on to see how you can improve and stuff like that, you know? What are your thoughts on the interface of After Effects? Because I know there were some moments where you were just searching like 10 minutes on where that bar tab went, you know? Okay, the and interface, on, yeah, it's, it's fiddly. And it is a thing that eventually sort of like you just morph into. It's like, it's like a square, it's like a square hole. You're a circle sized peg. You have to shove yourself in that square hole and morph yourself into it because After Effects is not going to change itself to suit your needs. You, it is you a, can't um, adjust like the layout. Oh, you can adjust the layouts and stuff, yeah. but like in terms of finding things, in terms of like as well, like the terms of okay, which window can I use to be rotoscoping like the girl's arm? Right. Um, how do I? Uh, how do I? When I've got like you know a path for like a mask. You know how it's like a vector. How do I like be able to move the mask? But now, how can I move like one of the corners of the mask and like morph and change that? How does that work? It's a lot of weird trial and error of sitting there and just fiddling with things. And eventually, you get it. But if you're starting out, it is frustrating. It is nothing is feels like it's you know intuitive. It's all like you're smashing your face against a brick wall. So yeah, how do I think about uh, After Effects? Is interface <laughs> it's so, I mean, painful it feels like you know with the vfx work there is just a lot of patience and there's a mm. lot of like a little bit of frustration right yeah. in yeah. it i mean where do you where do vfx artists and where do you get your enjoyment from in the edit because it feels like there's just a lot of waiting around a lot of rendering Where's, where's your enjoyment come for doing something like this? Well, I'm sure you can relate. When, you've, when you're filming, when you're doing, you know, your film work and you're doing your live action filming with the camera, and when it all finally comes together in a final film, like, the end result, it's magical, isn't it? Hmm. Like, don't you love it? And, I don't know, I get, a, I get a massive high when I see, like, the end result come before my eyes. And I'm like, oh, wow, I did that. Not only did I do that, but, it, like, it enhances the story. Damn, you know, <laughs> I feel over the moon uh, seeing that, you know? It's like, it's like finishing an artwork. You, you, you've got a blank canvas. You have no idea what it's going to look like at the end. But then you come up with something that you're actually proud of, and you put it on the wall, and you're like, that's an achievement, right? You know? It's like climbing a mountain. I climbed that bloody mountain. I, I painted that bloody canvas, you know? <laughs> So that's where I get my enjoyment for it. I, I'm sure you can relate, right? It's Absolutely. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, and I guess that's why that's why we do it, right? I mean, and people like looking like through the scope of like looking you watching you work mm. that don't know about the industry, they can see it. You know, um, it's all in the little details, right? Yeah. Like you know, a film is made of just individual shots. Like, yeah. One shot after the other. It's not like this one. You know. Unless you're doing like a long tracking shot, I guess. Um, as a as a famous YouTuber, uh, Mr. Plinkett once said, "You may you may not have noticed it, but your brain did when an error pops up." You know, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, audiences are very good with talking about movement. It's like it's so innate within us, right? So when you're animating something like a walk cycle, a walk cycle has a lot of things to it, and like it's considered to be, you know, it's pretty 
it's considered to be pretty stock standard that you can make you know a lot of different walk cycles but making them feel believable there's so many mechanics to it so many shifting of weight how characters can squash and stretch and how the head can bob and stuff like that there was an interesting story i read about in um richard williams uh rest in peace uh book named uh the animated survival kit and in it he was getting into his car and he was about to, you know, he was very tired, and he was about to turn the key, but then he looks up, and he sees this man walking, and his body is covered, hidden, hidden by the wall, right? But his head isn't moving, it's not bobbing. It's like almost as if he's on, like, you know, a Segway, and he's just sort of floating. Wow. And he's like, what is happening? Why, is, why isn't his head moving? So he actually was about to drive off, and he was like, wait a second, I'm an animator. I should know about this. And so he just gets out of his car, runs up behind the guy, and just follows him, and just tries tracking his movements. And what he found was that the guy had a bit of a, like, a bit of an effeminate walk, actually. He was, like, walking with his feet and, like, almost as if he was on a tightrope, one mm. or the other. So his head was not moving at all. And so he just, you know, learns about that. But it just goes to show that we are very much fascinated with movement. And while we may not understand the, like, you know, the nitty-gritties of it, we can see mistakes when they happen, right? right. So that's why there's so much effort put into it. And, you know... I guess that's why sometimes it's kind of hard to please because, wow, it, it looks like reality. I, I see reality every day, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I um I feel, you know, a buddy of mine didn't have a, like, VFX, like, short work. Mm. Um, stuff like you. Mm. Um, and I asked, and he, he did really good and people were talking about it. But people were more, more talking about the story than they didn't even mention, like, his VFX work. Okay. And I asked him, man, do you... Do you, does that like frustrate you when people don't mention it? And he and he turned to me and it kind of profoundly said, "No, because that means I've done my job." Yeah, and I'm like, huh. it's it's worse. I I get that feeling, but it's also it's worse for artists, people who like spend like slave away day and night yeah. making a painting, and then they put it on a wall. What do you think is the average time an audience member will look at that painting? Man, I'm gonna say like, unless you like it, two seconds. Or, yeah, but if you like it, I can also say like ten seconds, maybe even more. Yeah, like, yeah six seconds is the average. Wow, that's that's what the artist got for spending a week of their life making that painting. Six seconds. <laughs> it is a yeah. It's just one. It's just that problem all over again, isn't it? You spend all this effort, you make this beautiful thing, you put it out there to show the world, and it's only appreciated by people for six seconds. Man. For each person, I guess that's why I make a uh, film because even if you don't like it, you know you have to. You gotta sit through the bloody thing. Yeah, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta sit in there for at least, you know. And if you hate it, I can say, "Hey, I stole five minutes of your life, and you're never getting that back." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sort man. of malicious, you know. No, yeah, I don't. I, hope I, don't, I don't do it for that. <laughs> Remember, um, what was it? The Dead Don't Die, that film we watched. Oh. Um, that was a, that was a very interesting film. Yes, <laughs> we very both we both didn't like it. Um, Not a fan. Yeah, we um, but we came out of that film, and I feel like that's the exact same attitude the director has. You know what? I just took two hours of your life. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> and uh, good on him. <laughs> he got my bum and did a seat. Yeah, and, and I got your money, sucker. <laughs> yeah, and See, ya. I don't think I'll I don't think I'll ever walk out of a film. Mm. I don't know about you, but even a film like that that I found very, very dry, like not my humor at all. Yeah. I I like, turned and I sighed to Connor a few times. Yeah. But even then, I don't think I'll ever work. I mean, just maybe because I'm a filmmaker myself, I don't mm. think I'll ever. I just respect art forms like that too much. Yeah, I'm sort of the same. I don't think I've ever walked out of the film either. Um, do you stay for the credits? Do you like. Um, I stay for the main credits at least. Okay. So right. you know how they make like title sequences? Yeah, um, right. Where it's like the main actor. Yeah, and, and it'll be stuff. like the director and the screenwriter. Yeah. I'll stay for that. And then I'll be honest, uh, when the just the standard stock standard credits come on, yeah. then I start, to, I start to filter out. Okay. Um, I, I'm different because I'm an animator. I'm like, okay, where are the animators? <laughs> so when the, when the credits roll by in a big like blockbuster sort of film, I just love seeing the ginormous army of vfx artists and animators and all sorts of people that Riggers. makes sense that makes sense you do that because that is your line of and work. it's like it's like wow look at them all <laughs> it's like it's flipping army making all this stuff you know yeah that's what yeah i mean the amount of the amount of work that goes the back of it i don't think anyone can really comprehend it right yeah it's it's just 
It's just a weird phenomenon that I find. It's, I'm not the only a animator who does it. I find a lot of people do it as well. It's just like, oh, I just want to stick around for the animated credits. It's like, why? I don't know. <laughs> I just want to. But yeah, I guess I was gonna. I was leading back to that point where, um, I guess you, you have done your job when people stop noticing the animation in a way. Yeah. Especially for longer forms, like mm. maybe like a Disney film, right? Like yeah. um, Coco or something like that. Yeah. It's stunning. But then you've done your form as like the director and the screenwriter, I guess, when you can blend the VFX with the story so well. Yeah. And people, obviously you notice amazing, incredible visuals. Mm. Like, but in terms of like the average movie goer, yeah. um, you, don't, you want them to get lost and immersed into that world, yes. right? So you don't want there to be mistakes every two seconds where you pulled out the story again. It's like, oh, that was a bit jittery. Oh, that was a bit Yeah, solid. right. But then I've also noticed that if the story is so damn good, I find VFX artists can get away with, with like it. making a little mistake here or there. Yeah, right. Even even the the DOP and the actor and stuff, so to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I tend to notice that as well. So what ends up if the story is bad, then the only thing the audience is going to try and focus on is the visuals. Whereas if the story is so good, then the audience is invested in all of that. So yeah, it's just it's this weird thing where visuals really do prop up uh, the story. And that's what films at the end of the day, sh you know, what they are. It's uh, a story in um, film form told over time. You know, it's a similar philosophy with writing. Um, an author will also say that their job is done when the reader is not noticing the words on the page. They're just flying that's through good point. words, right? Yeah. You get to like the fifth chapter and you're like, what the hell was I reading for the last hour? I remember reading Artemis Fowl when I was a kid. And I remember it was like oh, the fifth book. I remember I read that whole thing in a day, and at the end of it, I was a little sick, but I was like, I didn't even realize, you know, I'd read through the whole thing. I just sort of started from page one, went to the very end, and then I was like, oh, I'm done. Wow. <laughs> you know? But what do you think of this statement? You can get away, a good story can have poor visuals, but, you know, yeah. uh, a bad story, like, you know, you can, you can have great visuals, but people are going to like the story with the worse of worse yeah. worse visuals more that's right um this is the way we build isn't it like that's the way we understand stories and that's absolutely right like and, i've um, seen yes people recommended me films that i think if i'm being like really like pedantic like don't look good visually like it's like not cinematic in my yeah. opinion um but man the story is so good you just don't care when you're halfway through it like what yeah. the, the it looks like there's um a film uh, called, I believe, The Edge of Tomorrow. It's a short animated film. It's also a movie. Um, but they're completely different two things. It, it might be Tom, Tom Cruise. It might be completely different. I might be thinking of something else anyway. Um, but the film is 2D animated, but the characters are like very basic. Like they're stick figures almost. But the film is very profound. You know, it's talking about these interesting philosophies i think it's called the world of tomorrow anyway uh and it's you know the most basic animated thing but the visuals and the patterns like they're sort of trippy but also just the dialogue that's being exchanged between this little girl and this older clone of her it's, it's just fascinating to watch so you can do a lot with very little you know yeah. um it's surprising <laughs> What's something that surprised you the most coming out of the Alien Arm short we did? Something that surprised me the most? I guess the final look. Um, because we talked about, like we said, we talked about many different designs and how it was going to look and stuff like that. Mm. But eventually we just settled on one that was, you know, it's simple, yeah. but it works, right? It works. It, and it's, it's just like exactly what we talked about. It, it works. It doesn't need to be any more complex. It doesn't need to have any more, like, the simple, the fact that it lights up and dims and how it pulses. There's enough character there. There is, yeah. You don't, you don't need anything else. We don't need eyeballs racing along her arm. That would take us way longer. And all of us wouldn't add anything. Exactly. Kind of it could pull you out as well. Yeah. Because, in a way, I didn't want people to be completely fixated on just the VFX. Yeah. I didn't want people to be like, oh, VFX is happening on the screen now. Yeah. You, know? you want it to enhance, and you did amazing like that. Yeah. Essentially, like, every time you pinpointed, you know, it, it really blended well with Rachel's acting. Yeah. I really think it did. Like, a few, a few people have said to me, so what did you guys use on set? 
Like, no. Rachel's like, absolutely nothing. Nothing. We, uh, we just told Rachel, okay, uh, grab your arm and wrestle around with it and stuff yeah. like that. And you all, you asked, James, do we need a green light? Should we cover her arm in like a green sock? Or could we get like a green light and shine it mm. on her? And the thing is, if we had done that, we would have made it worse. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm glad. Yeah, and also, it been very tough. And you kind of need to know when you're going to like light it up and very like yeah. you need to really storyboard that on us you know you yeah know. you need to really plan that and um you don't storyboard you just dive right in don't you i guess what i was thinking was that you know how in the scene the marvel films and dc and stuff where yeah i see it behind the scenes and when there's like a kryptonite come on like i'll see like a gaff or someone they'll flash her green light on like batman's face or something like that yeah like, right okay so they do that so then should we should i is that how we should do our thing well it always depends, you know? I mean, yeah, right? But that's because um, the kryptonite's, like, off-screen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But I guess what I was thinking is, is it easier to immerse it when you have... I mean, I think when you, if you know exactly what you're doing, mm. it's good to have practicals, practically, like, have oh, yeah. as much practicals helping to be effect. How would you go about lighting up, like, creating green light? It doesn't look like it's coming from off-screen when it's All an right. arm. So, for stuff. example, I mean, for Skyfall... Roger Deakins had like 20, 30 big LED soft lights in right. the field. Yeah. Um, essentially, that was, um, he did that and he they keyed the VFX out and it was fire. Okay. And it was actually in the shot. So, the, you know, the guy's face is here. Yeah. And the, the James Bond and behind him is just 20, 30 yeah. like LED lights that are red and they're like flickering. Like, yeah, flickering like nice, beautiful, soft fire in the distance. Mm. And then the VFX after just like, um, took out the lights and replaced it with fire. Right. And it was so seamless. And um, the thing about fire, as we both know after doing that uh, horror-themed film, is that fire is very hard to keep consistent. Yep, that's why he used actual lights and, yeah. And now whenever I see fire, I'm always noticing, wait, they probably added that in and post, you yep. know? <laughs> um, it was so hard when we did ours, practically. Yeah. So do you like, to give you context for listening to it, we did yeah. a horror film um, a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, maybe it was actually last year, sorry. It just feels like a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, it was last it was year, wasn't last it? Year. Oh my God. And you know, I, I'm a big fan of practicals. Um, and also in Sydney, it's hard to like have a fire anywhere in the city area. Mm. Um, so I was really fortunate that a lot of the boys from college were keen yeah. to get on a bus for the short horror. Yeah. And we went out to Blue Mountains and we camped one night and we had a fire and we actually had a fire scene, a proper yeah. fire scene. And this is from our film competition at our college, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we sh- went out, we did the whole shebang. We actually went, found a set, found a campsite. I'm like, okay, boys, none of you are actors. We're going to make a fireplace. We're going to make a camp and everything. And it was intense. It was intense. And it was so hard. Yeah. Because, like, Sherman was DOP for me. And he does a great job. Yeah. Um, like, you know, he, he has an eye, that I, you know, for stuff like that. And, yeah, because, I mean, he was shooting it. And he was always saying to me, more fire, more fire. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Dude, what are you talking about? And we had to get the actors, like, okay, grab sticks, yeah. you know. And everyone was just running into the forest, grabbing a bunch of like you know kindle and chucking it but kindle burns really quick yeah we had to get like if we were to do that again we'd have to get like full-on logs and yeah. like because they burn for a long time exactly but the thing is they don't burn like a fire they just sort of you know burn slowly that's yeah. why to make for good firewood because they heat up the yeah. room so the they... problem like was having is it looked really great on camera for like a minute or two yeah and it went down the like the literal brightness levels like yeah. and that's why Sherman was always saying more fire yeah because it yeah for some reason so we needed to get cons- this consistent fire yeah um and man that's why they just have like a light you know and then they just yeah. Like they replace it with VFX and post. I noticed in the TV series of Fargo in season two, they had a fireplace and he was chucking in like things. And I noticed that the fire was added in post. And it's like a 2D painting with like animated movement. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> mm. They had the same problems we had. I bet that's just an LED in, in that fire pit that's just flickering, you know? Yeah, that's what that's what I've seen behind the scenes. They have like, you know, when um, homeless people are like on yeah. fire, mm. like they literally have inside the the can or canister or mm. the trash can like an led light just like just going up and down and yeah they replace it and then the top of the can is just like flickers of embers and fire yeah. it's what you got to do you know fire is a pain in the ass to film my goodness so yeah we did that i remember i was an actor in that film um i was the guy because it was a horror film 
I got my mouth sewn. And I remember having to use a lighter, and because like I've never used like a lighter before, I was having a lot of trouble <laughs> turning this bloody thing on. I was like, sorry, hang on. <laughs> that was cool though. I yeah. enjoyed that. What? Oh man, looking back on it, one thing that would have made it really cool in that scene that mm. I don't know how we just. I think it was just limitations of lighting we had. It yeah. would have made it absolutely better. Was um. Have the forest lit in the background a little bit, where there's like yeah. streaks of moonlight or something. Oh, because okay. now that you think about it, it's like completely black. Yeah, like the background because it's yeah. just absolutely dark. And I'm like, this looks good, but what is it that's missing? And then looking back on it a year from now, some right? depth, right, in the forest, right? Like and that. look, we look. I know Sherman wanted Sherman wanted like beautiful moonlight, I and mean, we just couldn't get it because I mean it was um, that's just the limitations we had. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like doing it, we had like one night. We were lucky we were using the A7S, which um, is good for low light sensitivity. Mm. Um, you couldn't you couldn't use like a cinema camera. You couldn't right. use because cinema cameras, the ISO, like they want they want you to keep it at like eight hundred. Yeah. Where we bumped the A7S like five thousand to just get it. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> man, you it's if you're gonna light if you're gonna light a fire practically, mm. you better do it like in like a studio set, man. Yeah. You know? I I mean, the film looks really good. I mean, the acting is another story, but the film looks... <laughs> <laughs> it does look good, and I all that Sherman. Like, I mean, I feel like we could, I could have made the story better, looking back on it. Mm. You know, it was, like, super rushed, and we didn't have much time, and it was quite ambitious, but... It was very ambitious. It looked good, and we only got second place in the competition, and we lost against a story that was admittedly better. Didn't look as good, but, mm. <laughs> you know... But hey, um, well, that goes back to my idea, isn't it? Yeah, that, like story trumps visuals almost in a way. What a sad reality it is. <laughs> but, <you know? laughs> it was good though because for a while I was very just visually focused. Mm -hmm. I was very like, I don't care what the story is, as long as it looks good, it's better than your film. You know? Yeah, like, right. I didn't say that, and obviously I'll never say that. But I feel that's what a lot of um, maybe people my age or getting into it think because I guess with better cameras and easier to film stuff and like you know cheaper led lights to buy yeah um, a lot of people are turning into just um like self-made dops or such yeah like they they think they can get good visuals and you know it's but i think everyone forgets that it's you know everyone in a way you can you can technically get something right mm. but it's at the end of the day like if you're making a short film in the cinema world it's all about the story yeah and um, in my my opinion, if you're uh, an independent filmmaker, uh, keep it short. <laughs> Don't make it hours long. Do it. Do it. We're done. Like five minute films, be good to go. You know. And then yeah, when you get the level of funding and stuff, then yeah. go for it. But man, it's like a short film is already hard enough for us. Yeah. Right. Um. There, it's the same with the animation world as well. It used to be that back in the days of classical Disney, if you wanted to animate, you needed like all sorts of ridiculous equipment. Uh, you need a big table, then you need to get some cameras, and then the, the things that you draw would have to be sent off from the film that you made into like a testing room. And so you have no idea how your animation looks mm. until like the end of the day, and you submit it in the morning. So you get it back, and you realize, oh, this, the character looks a bit floaty here, or something like that, so I've got to fix it now. But today, everything's instant. You jump on the computer, you can see what your animation looks like with just pressing the space bar key. It's like, oh, that's what it looks like. Great, I can edit that. So everything's becoming like smaller scale. There's a great series of animated films called Astartes um, on YouTube. It's made by a single guy, but it's the most breathtaking stuff I have ever seen. It's incredible. Like, it's so well detailed. Like, you, you think like a whole production company was behind this, but no, it's just a single guy. Oh my god. <laughs> it almost sounds like you were saying you are getting frustrated in After Effects. Mm. It almost sounds like we should be damn grateful for how easy VFX is now more than ever. We don't we don't realize how easy things are because so we've damn easy. grown up uh, with convenience. So yeah. it's almost like we're spoiled by convenience in many ways, you know? Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's new problems. What is it? First world problems, they First say, or something like that. And I yeah. guess because we're artists, we are the epitome of talking about first world problems. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, man, it's, I mean, I guess every generation says this, but it's so easy to make a film nowadays, more yeah. than ever. Yeah. Like, go out and what, what we did. Like, you don't need 
back then, you know, was just film cameras and you need an actual big computer to do VFX or whatever. Yeah. You need like a studio, you need funding. But what did we do? We had like a weekend. We just used all our gear put together. Yeah. And we just like came up with creative mind and, you know. And you can rent a lot of the stuff as well, the equipment yeah. that you need. So you don't need to own this stuff. You can just be like, oh, just yeah. pop a half a hundred dollars, have the equipment for a day, shoot a film, and you're done. It, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Also, your yeah. phone. Your phone has a surprisingly okay camera on it. You can film using that. Um, at Rain, oh, yeah. um, like, what was it? The action, or so it was like two years ago, there was an action film event at the college that instead did. And the boys just shot on their iPhone. Okay. And when they wanted to do jo like dolly shots, they just got like an office chair and they stuck the camera on like at the bottom of the chair yeah, and, and just wheeled it around. Man, the iPhone has great in camera stability, stabilization. Yeah. So I mean, damn, like it, it looked like it was actually properly well filmed, you know? Wow. And you color graded properly. Yeah. Um, you know, lighting. They put the, the desaturated mm -hmm. color filter, so everything was oh, kind of gray geez. and moody. Yeah. And the sound the uh, the sound design was like, you know, what can you do? <laughs> they didn't have a boom operator, like, whatever. But it's great stuff. I love it. Um, yeah. I've come out with other films and stuff in there as well. There was, um, oh, what was that guy's name? Uh, he's gone away now. Um, he did, like, a drama. He and passed stuff like away? That. No, he's not passed away. Oh. He's left Australia because he's oh, working oh. overseas. You remember him? Um, oh, uh, do you know Luke? Maybe, but oh, he he studied at NIDA, did he? Yeah, um, did he study at NIDA? I don't know. Nah, he but was. was he left the castle wheel. Remember? Oh, Peter. Peter. Yeah. <laughs> when were you on a film with Peter? Um, I was help. I was literally just behind the scenes helping you guys or whatever. Remember, I was the one who had to like carry the big black velvet. Curtain. I was with a Fay Fox, uh, the makeup artist, was also on that project. Oh, do you mean Lockie Man? Yes, Lockie Man. Put a show reel. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's gone to Canada now. Yeah, yeah, and so is Chloe for um, the VFX yeah. that we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I hope they um, love that VFX stuff, by the way. Dude, what, what's that line she'd always say in the film that you were seeing? Um, strange, right? Strange, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a bone in that, my brain. We watched that so many times. Strange, right? We, I reckon we, we could rehearse. We could. Re we, we, we could I mean, I think any film you make, I guess you can, I can get every line down pat. Like oh, what they say. It's the same with like music as well. When you're doing like a music video, you know, like you get so intimate with the song for some reason. It's yeah. like, I know where the beats are happening. I know where here's, I can, I can hear the chord progressions where other people like wouldn't hear that. They'd just be hearing the melody and stuff like that. So it's the same thing with animation. You just, a lot of animators talk about how they just get sick <laughs> of the, of the thing that they just made because they've, watched it so many times well, i remember when i finished when you sent me the vfx and i um cleaned up everything yeah you didn't even watch i didn't it, watch you? it yeah. i didn't watch it i was so well to be fair i was very busy uh, i'm still at university i'm studying fine arts now uh, but i was like oh I, I spent all this work on this vfx uh university now i need to play catch up and get all that stuff done also i pulled like a bunch of all-nighters to get that the you VFX did. thing you done. really did and I so we just message I was, my messenger would pop at like 4am in the morning for yeah. the screenshot update when you what you were doing yeah and you <laughs> people don't realise man people you were uh, you come realize. to pick up the final film uh, had it rendered we went to go watch a movie because it was rendering it then stopped to like you know the quarter way mark and see like oh we have to do it again and then you woke me up at like 8 a.m and we're like is it ready i'm still in bed i'm like i don't know <laughs> so, oh man that was that was fun that's like typical friends making a film oh you know <laughs> maybe it's all about the friends we made along the way and then the pain and agony and all that stuff i remember me being so tired i was like here here it is it's on your thing is it done no it's still going <laughs> oh, geez. i was so sleepy i think i was about to fall over so what's that what's what do you see yourself take what do you, where do you see yourself about two or three years from now all right so i'm still studying at university i've graduated from media arts mm. majoring in animation and i am now doing fine arts so i'm learning the classics now and i've got two more years of that mm. and then in my third year there is an animation master's course at the university of technology sydney um called the animal logic program and it looks really good and i feel like that will be my last step for education 
and then I'll be ready to go into the animation business. What I see myself in three years is doing that. And where I see myself after that is I really want to be like a sort of a producer or an animation lead. I find that I actually really enjoy the organizational making timetables, making sure everyone's on the ball of things. It's quite, quite yeah, a, well, what's, actually. What's it called? Um, the VFX lead. supervisor. Yeah, supervisor. Yeah. Animation supervisor and stuff like that. But that's like a, that's a, you have to work your way on most of that, right? Um, well, that's the great thing about this Animal Logic UTS program because you can immediately start um, learning about those skills in that program yeah. because everyone else is doing animation, but you're organizing them. You're setting up the, the dailies, you're setting up the, you know, okay, updates. Um, I'm setting up the time, like, you know, what, when are you going to get that done? I'm going to hold you to that. You're setting up the timetables and stuff like that. Do you need yeah. to study animation to get into the business? Um, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> if you're going to be an animation like lead, yeah, you definitely do. Um, but um, I think, I mean, but just of your experience the last couple of months of helping me for my film on mm. set experience. Yeah. You feel, I feel like you've learned so much just from that then than almost like a semester or, yeah. or studying a degree in that. Yeah, it's it's weird, isn't it? Like, um, I felt like I've learned a lot uh, from your crew, um, just setting up things and stuff like that and understanding the process. Um, I just, because, just in my experience, I mean, I don't know if it's different, I just feel in the creative industry, when, when I, because I work at the front, yeah. I, I, you know, when, when some, when photographers and filmmakers come in, we're not looking at the degree they have. No. We're looking straight at their website and their work and their networking and how they talk it's... to us and their client base. We don't, I mean, I'm just being brutally honest. We don't care what you studied. We yeah. Don't, and even, even for me, like, I don't, I don't want people and I don't personally care myself that I graduated from UNESCO. Yeah. I, I love it. I had fun. It's a good degree to have, whatever, but that I don't use that for any of my jobs I've got. Right. Any gigs. Um, it's, um, I've talked to a lot of animation people about this as well. It's very similar. Um, however, one person I talked to was like, okay, I'll give it a cause or a glance. I'll see what he's done. I'll be like, oh, he's um, done like customer service. So I know he's, you know, good for talking with people and stuff like that. Okay. Now show me the show reel because that's, that's where the real idea. business is here. Yeah. Um, and your portfolio is often considered to be your actual CV um, because that's, that's what you're, that's shows you've got the goods, right? You've got yeah. the talent. So, yeah, I get that. I get that a lot. But also, with the Masters, I feel like doing the Masters it improves my portfolio. The Masters is entirely designed about what they advertise themselves as is the gateway, the bridge between you've got your degree to you getting a job. And you fill in this role with helping you make your portfolio, with you working with a bunch of other people, mm -hmm. and you spend the entire year making both a VR like game and like VR is like the cusp of technology. So people are impressed to hear when you've worked in VR and then making a short film. And when you can show people shots of the short film that you made, you also are telling them that I've been a part of a team of animators who have made this film together. I worked well with them. Um, you can talk to them about me as well. But like my portfolio is this film. I have experience. How often do you read online about like, you know, finding a job where they want, it's an entry level job, but they want like a year of experience before you can get it. It's like, it's an entry level job. Why do you want me to have a year of experience? It seems to happen a lot, um, but you know, I feel like the masters uh, fills that, you know, mm. role really well. Because I, it's experience. What I, hope, I, hope it do, I hope it does for you, man. Yeah. Because I mean, I would just hate, I, I would, it would hurt me to see that you have so much talent and I guess, you're almost, uh, you know, prolonging getting a great job or getting work in the industry. Yeah, there is always, that. it's always that feeling, is it? Like, you know, like, I feel like a rabbit, I gotta go. I gotta well, get it it's done. It's almost like I feel in the one film of VFX you're gonna work in the whole year at this Masters, mm. you could do like five, you know, on your own and through like creators and reaching out to people. Ah, uh, you know, you say that, but also, I've, here's what I heard okay sorry yeah, yeah. like you say that and um yeah right I've definitely heard that okay this person did an honest project and that honest project that took him a year um and stuff like that but I feel like this improves your portfolio and mm -hmm. immediately gets you from an entry level position into like a higher level position right. and you learn a lot of things along the way you are talking to people who have been a part of the industry mm -hmm. and stuff like that for 
a long time. Like yeah, absolutely. Probably like ha- as long as you know since I've been ten, so <laughs> like twelve years or so. Here's what I've heard about film school. Yeah, uh, the big um, meme of film, film school. Yes. Well, <laughs> I've heard that. Um, look, a lot of people in the industry believe that. Um, I don't know what I've heard from someone's experience mm-hmm. about the idea of film school, not film school. Like, so there's some the benefits of film school is that. It gets you off your ass making stuff. Yep. Um, for people who aren't, who you know, who want to do it but aren't as motivated, the idea of film school it gives you a deadline. It gives yeah. you assessment tasks. It gives you a deadline to make something, and you know, people do it. That Whereas seems reasonable. In, yeah. in in like, if you go to make your film yourself, like mm-hmm. even for me, I fall susceptible to this. Everyone does. Yeah. When you go to make something yourself, um, it can take you you don't have a deadline yeah you know if i want to write a script i'll spend like a year on it you yeah know? whereas like if i went to a film school and they said in six weeks you have to hand in a script you damn well finish that script and you get mm. handed in mm. and it's nearly probably just as good as quality as you were going to spend a year on it yeah so the benefits of film school is you shoot stuff you edit stuff you make stuff you get it out there yeah shoot edit get it out there shoot edit get it out there yeah and um that's something that i think film school is good for in terms of it gives you uh, deadlines it gets it gets you connected to other people with the same mind and passions and stuff like that yeah here's the thing though mm. um i do feel that there's a lot that you just honestly learn through doing yeah and if you're self-driven enough you don't need to you don't really need it as much okay yeah. um my film school experience was great yeah it was great in terms of just the uni life i lived yeah the degree itself unfortunately it's more tailored to people writing film about films than making right. than making films. yeah unsw has a bit of a problem i think where they really are obsessed about papers they want you writing essays and stuff like that i don't want to write research. essays i don't want to write essays either and i think unsw is actually lagging behind the competition i think um because of all these essays and stuff like that they're turning people away People don't want to come to UNSW to write a 3,000 word essay uh, and stuff like that. People want to come to film skill and stuff like that to get hands-on experience Yeah, and learn that stuff. Learn the nitty gritty because that's what's important. The, for them. the problem is as well is they have to be, they have to structure the course that everyone can do it. Hmm. So my first like film course there, they yeah. talk about three point lighting. Yeah, the basics. They talk about how to turn the camera on. Yeah. You know, and this is, and I've, I've like, you know, I'm coming from a background where I just, I'm shooting every like weekend, just my own stuff. I'm mm. watching YouTube tutorials on how to better myself. I'm, you know, going out there, listening to other people's advice. So, I mean, it was a little bit like, okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, that's tricky, right? Mm. So it's tricky is uh, the institution. Yeah. yeah. There was, um, you know, the old Christian monks from medieval period uh, learnt this pretty well. They had a mantra. And they said that learning is relearning. Mm. And it's also tricky because when you're writing a course, you can't just, okay, we've got an intermediate thing. So you could like skip a year and you can just join this. Mm. But the problem with that is that you might miss things and therefore you might be behind the people who had the full year and you won't even realize it. And you'd be like, oh, I'm actually behind and so therefore you actually become demotivated because you actually have to play catch up with everyone else and stuff right. like that. So it's almost as if you sort of have to take your medicine, you have to relearn these stages, perhaps relearn your technique because perhaps you picked up some bad habits, who knows, and you know, uh, better yourself and see this as an opportunity to improve what you already know, mm. right? Mm. So that's how I would, that's my point of view on it. Um, mm. So, and with the essays as well, um, everything is linked together. Like, as much as I may complain about writing a 3,000 word essay about robots and creativity, it is still fascinating to end of the day think about, wow, that's now enhancing my creative process because now I'm thinking about robots all the bloody time. And I've now got this interesting perspective because it also enhances you as a bit of a person as well. It makes you more well-rounded, well, more cultured, because you're forced to write about things that you otherwise wouldn't have been bothered to do. So I sort of get, okay, why they, essays are still a part of, you know, film skill or animation school or whatever. And I can see why, you know, some people, like, they do a two-year program instead of a three-year one where they just use practical stuff. Mm-hmm. But 
like perhaps they'd be more limited. Like, for example, I'm doing fine arts right now. Do you think fine arts is going to help me in my animation and stuff like that? To be honest, hmm? no. <laughs> okay, I disagree. I think it's all going to help. I think it's me learning about what the art sure, scene is talking about. Sure, sure, it does. Okay, no, let me rephrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't not help, right? Yeah, right. If you do something for three years, I mean, unless it's the worst course out there. Yeah, right. right? You're going to get some benefit from it, <laughs> mm. right? Like, I don't know. Like, for me, man, I could have done honors. I could have done masters. I could have gone to another film school. And yeah, like, right. I could have just dropped some thousands of dollars more on a film degree or masters. Yeah, right. Um, or, or... Should I invest in some good assets of equipment? Mm -hmm. Should I invest in some really practical online courses like full time filmmaker, um, who you know teaches a lot about the practicalities of shooting events and weddings and um, cinematic stuff, like very practical to the industry, very practical in like I guess um, <laughs> getting jobs that or you know, getting work that you know you can actually make a living from and yeah. make this your career in a way or mm. getting yourself off invest in you know getting a website yeah getting um getting talking to people in the industry talking to clients talking to clientele investing mm. in google ads and marketing yeah should i invest that money into a degree like that or should i invest it in this and right. i chose to do the like i chose to um invest in the the former the, yeah yeah right and look at you now you're running a podcast you're doing wedding photography and stuff like that and um you're still interested in doing film, right? And stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a long-term thing. And like, I absolutely, I want to, I, I want to say I am going to direct the yeah. film one day. Um, What's your plan of getting to that stage? You know? I'm you just... know, on, honestly, mm. um, it's a good point. And I'm, I'm reading a book now called The Four Hour Work Week. And yeah, I, I noticed that on your show. And one of the things in the first few chapters he talks about is writing your six month plan down um, and just writing it down on a piece of paper. And then from there, you know, you kind of know, and then from there, talk about, okay, what are you doing to get to that point? Right. So I'll be honest, last few months, last six months, I've been investing a lot in my videography, yeah. a lot of weddings, mm. um, a lot of uh, my ground up like work, like uh, events and stuff like that in the industry. Yeah. Um, a lot of photography. So my, my, I guess, my feature film, my directing has taken a little bit of a backseat. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I say is because one thing that's really important they say if you want to, you know, direct and stuff one day is you should st you should write. Yeah. You should actually keep writing. Just start, writing. Start, write. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what that's what I think is going to help me. Um, writing scripts, writing stuff that you can um, you can take to potential like people that can fund it and you know um, and you know one one really uh, really popular way a lot of people are doing now is you write a script. And then you essentially make a short of that script. Right. Or you make like a little showreel thing. Yeah. And then you can take that and pitch it to people. Writer, editor, producer, director. <laughs> Do it <together. laughs> um, So that's one thing that I talk about, but am I really doing that? To be honest, I'm not really at the moment. I'm investing a lot of my weddings and my um, my wedding business, Fable Wedding Films, to start it up. Yeah. Because um, I also have like a full-time job at uh, the studio I work at. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to like balance that a little bit. Yeah. Because well. um, I love my job there. I love, I love, um, yeah. So I mean, it's just trying to do a lot. And I guess it's just networking. And also, I guess to direct, I want to believe you have to be quite smart, <laughs> you know? Yeah. To make a, to be a good director anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I guess understand how order roles work, understand how you talk to people. Yeah. And I don't, uh, I mean, I, I, this could be an excuse, but I don't want to rush it and just and make something mediocre. You know? Yeah, right. Um, if you have the time, you know, use that time to just get a, a, a you know experience in the industry as you can. Yeah. Like Denis Villeneuve, one of my favorite directors. He directed Arrival and the new Blade Runner and right. Sicario and Prisoners. Oh my god, I love all those films. <laughs> he, um, he said he had a goal when he was younger to direct his first feature at the age of 28. Right. But he said that was a silly goal. He said he'd rather... I, I don't think it was a silly goal. Look at him now. Yeah. But he said if he had to give himself advice uh, back then, he said, read, read, yeah. read, read, read. Read more scripts. Read more about you know what you're interested in mm. um, and write. How do you um 
Are you reading a lot of scripts and stuff like that? Or? No, oh. and I'm being completely honest, I'm not. And I know I should. Okay. Because um, I'm just wondering, where would you get, like, where would you find resources for Are you like kidding? That? It's all online, man. Do people just post, like, Dude, actual yeah. official scripts yeah. and stuff like that? Feature like? film scripts, yeah. Really? Dude, it, it, once it's done, like, the official, like, why hide it? It's out there, the movie's out there. So, I mean, I, look, I'll be honest, yeah. You can get feature scripts of so many. I don't I know. Have, I have some of the documents on my thing. Yeah. On my thing. Like, so, I, I, I don't know, where do I start? Heaps. Yeah. Um, Avengers, Silence, um, whatever I've got on my thing now. Um, do any, any films out there, most of them. Right. Like, it's either um, someone has done a distinct copy. Yeah. Or it's the... Uh, it's 99% of the time, yeah. you can actually find the original. Yeah. And you know it's the original because it's like, that sh it's like shittily scanned. And yeah. like it's actually like got markings and stuff. How do you know it's authentic? It's shittily scanned. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. If, it, if it's too clean, no, scrap it. No. <laughs> it's just like got that watermark of Celtex 2019. Yeah. Then, then you know, oh, this movie made in the 70s probably wasn't made on Celtex 2019. Yeah, right. Um, but dude, yeah, it's so. See, man, the, that's interesting you asked that question. Mm. Yeah, I feel like that's the idea and the attitude a lot of young people have. Mm. A lot of people starting out. It's like, oh, what? How do I get access to it? It's like, have you even tried? Yeah. You know? um, to be honest, I just am under the assumption that they just wouldn't put it up there because yeah. in animation, Why? for example, they don't put um, they don't put like you know the works in progress of how they made things online too much. They make like films and like how oh, they it's made more it. More popular nowadays, man. You'll yeah. see like a, a screenshot of the timeline of like Frozen. Yeah. And they'll show like the animators' timeline of it, and they'll show all the key frames and everything that they have to do for that, that one shot yeah, but i'm like can i like get access to the entire like library no, i resources? mean that's different they, i mean same as like film you don't have yeah. i don't have access to the entire footage or yeah, the films yeah, yeah. Right. but like it's just a script it's like what people are seeing on the tv it's just yeah. words on a script on a page yeah um it's already done they're not i'm not getting access to future scripts yeah you know? right i'm getting stuff to old scripts that are done um, so I mean, a film that when it came out in the cinemas now, I probably won't be able to get access to the script just then because yeah. it's still being played around the world. But give it a year, yeah, and it'll be up there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, there's actually like websites called like um, MovieScriptSS.com, something like that. Okay. Um, and there's also like a guy called Lessons from the Screenplay that mm. um, you probably would have watched one of his videos. Yeah. Everyone has. Um, he breaks down scripts and he talks about like where you can find the scripts online to okay. watch it. Um, oh wow! So I mean, dude, it's out there. That's what I'm telling you. It's out there. Like, I don't need to pay. I mean, it's weird. Like, there's just so much free knowledge there, out there. There is, right? Um, you know? It's the world we're living in. But um, people aren't putting their, their foot forward. You yeah. Know? Um, well, it's also the fact that we're living in a privileged time where a lot of people, like, we're riding the shoulders of giants. And a lot of people have walked the paths that we've walked before. And then have put what they've found and what they've done on the internet. So we could just go and look at it and just you know learn more quickly it's like you know the older yeah. generation teaching the younger and therefore the younger is going to improve more quickly and therefore they're destined to do even greater things it's like yeah. wow <laughs> you know yeah it's just insane like i mean it's just it's really i'm really grateful man for like mm. having that out there like if i have a question about filmmaking yeah. i can just literally type it on youtube and i have the answer yeah. you know where did you have that 20 years ago you didn't in fact youtube was YouTube even around? I don't think so. No. Bloody hell. The internet was what probably on like um, a dial up or something. Yeah, like or something like that. You know, yeah. and I remember floppy disks were still a thing when I was five. Um, they, they were all over the place. I'd ruin a lot of them because I thought they made great art when I was five. <laughs> Dude, even even reaching out to people in the industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's I I haven't done it, but I'm planning to do it. Like reach out to just directors I really admire, um, and I think. I don't know. For some reason, I'm like, oh, I can't. Like, come on, they're two big shots. But, but the times that I have tried to reach out to just people I thought I couldn't, hmm. like they responded and they were happy to have a conversation and chat to me. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, why don't people try this more often? And often they're just an average, like they're just like you and I. They're like yeah. average cool people who are happy to give you a little bit of their time if you just show them a little bit of genuine interest. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Um, I met the. I forget his name, so that's a bit awkward, but I met the guy who was like the lead of Light and Magic, which was the company that made all the effects for Star Wars, mm. and he was the visual lead for all the things for, fan like, you know, Phantom Menace and stuff like that. So I met the guy, 
and I talked to him. And he's such a cool fellow. <laughs> he's so happy to give you his time and be like, yeah, I did this and stuff like that. I'm so happy you liked Peter Rabbit, <laughs> which is the near, like the most recent thing that he's worked on. That's he, great, man. Yeah. And Peter like, Rabbit, um, they went to a pair of gear from the front for that film. Oh, really? Yeah, so I, mean, I was always holding like some PA or stuff like that. Where were they shooting? Um, they were shooting around Australia. They are shooting at Fox Studios a lot. Isn't it set in England? Did Films, I, man. Yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, like, I'm sure they would, like, they would take us some shots of, like... Isn't God cool as a set in space? Space, you know? But, like, surely they'd be like, okay, if I'm going to shoot Harry Potter, I would literally go to, like, a, a, tr a British train station and take some shots in there, right? Yeah. Just to make it authentic. Well, that's right? what I thought. That's what I thought growing up watching films. Like, yeah, right. Oh, man, they must go <laughs> to that exact spot. Middle left. <laughs> Where's middle left? <laughs> they must go to that seat, exactly in the middle of the scene, and shoot that. Yeah, yeah. right, but... No. <laughs> and people still do it, and I really just respect that, you know? Films yeah. really are just illusions. It's just magicians throwing crap at us, <laughs> and we're like, oh, they did what? <laughs> All the time. It's great fun, isn't it? And one line um, that I heard um, that really, I guess I try to tell myself, um, because sometimes when you're making a film, you get too caught up in making it for other filmmakers in a way or like or yeah oh how, yeah or how how other vfx artists would do it i think i asked you this right yeah and someone said to me um oh, i heard this on a podcast you don't make magic for the magician yeah yeah you don't make it magic for the magician all no. you make magic for the guy pulling that tap upstairs you know <laughs> it's, it's exactly what you do i'm you know I guess you're sort of my audience, but like I'm gonna lump you all in with everyone else, right, Mister Mister Fellow Director? You're everyone's uh, all gonna watch my film together, and you're all gonna enjoy it. I guess um, as film people and stuff like that, like we're more privy to how they make the film and stuff like that, so we can appreciate like the the effort and detail that they can put into making things and stuff, right? Mm. So. It's almost as if we're more willing to suspend our disbelief, you know? Like, it's like, oh, you know, I know what's happening, and I know how you did that shot, but I'm going to pretend I didn't know, <laughs> because I think that was beautiful, right? Delaney, what's something that you're going through now, um, or, like, you're challenging yourself with, you're trying to get better at? In terms of your VFX, or just in general? Animating. Um, currently, I am working with some friends that um, I got from Media Arts. Yes, mm. I, I got friends. I plucked them off a shelf. Um, and we are making a like a short animation hmm. um, in Maya, so it's 3D, and the guy's amazing. Um, he's already rigged and set up the scenes and stuff. But we are going to make a short film about a robot that is being manipulated into creating, generating electricity. Damn! Um, Don't give too much away. I think short thing. But yeah, yeah that sounds cool. It's really, What's your role in it? Um, animator. I'm going to be a character animator. Key animator. Uh, yeah. Key ones. Key. Well, it's because there's only, like, three of us right now, so I guess we're going to be ha juggling many different hats. Yeah. But, um, yeah, animator's my big role, and my plan is to get, like, you know, more portfolio-worthy uh, stuff mm -hmm. by putting my heart and soul into that. Great. Yeah. So that's something that I am challenging with myself right now. Personally, on a character level, um, one thing I like to do is when I wake up, I will, or before I go to sleep, I will get out a sheet of paper and I will write three things that I'll have to do by the end of the day. And before I go to bed, I'll make sure those three things are done. And then I'll write three things that I want to do by the end of the day. And those may or may not be done. So things I need to be done and things that I want to be done. So things like, you know, uh, reading a book or something like that, or relaxing or listening to music or going to see a film with you on Mondays. Um, so I find that that adds a little bit of organization in my life because without it, otherwise I'm just a, I'm a disorganized person. I need a list. <laughs> I need a to-do list of things to do in my life. That's so, great. Yeah. Um, I heard um, the statistic, you're 42% mm. more likely to achieve what you do writing it down. Yeah. Do you feel like that's the case for you? Yeah. I flatly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Works for me. Might be a pl might be a placebo. I don't know, but uh, it seems to work well it's for crazy, me. It's crazy, right? Like in my head, it's like, well, whatever. You can have so many ideas and goals in your head, but writing it down just seems something about it just seems it seems so off. final, right? This seems so decisive. I think because you write it down, you get it out of your head, and you know maybe writing it down is the first step into bringing it into reality. Mm. You know, when it's in your head, you maybe have this subconscious thing that it's fake or not real right it's yeah. imaginary it's uh, when you write it nebulous. down yeah when you write it down it's ingrained on a piece of paper the ink is there yeah and 
it's it can be real almost you know it's the first step in making it real yeah it's like i like i just said it uh, it becomes like less nebulous i love the word nebulous by the way what like is nebulous purpose, it just means this word nebulous it just means you know you know what a nebula is like it's in space it's just a cloud of formless gas it's yeah. not really doing anything but and you know it's sort of shapeless right so think of that and then when you write something down, it's as if that cloud is just gone. Mm. And suddenly this is a concrete nugget or something, you know? So what? nebulous just means something that. You can Google it. Like, here's, here's how you test, test someone if they actually know what the word means. But nebulous just means something that, like, it's not well defined. Mm. Or is um, cloudy, murky, or, like, not, you're not entirely right, sure what it means, right? right? Yeah. Hey, what's something. something last couple of years that, I don't know what's some, what's one thing you've gone through that's like really helped you like you've really um learned from or overcome um really learned to overcome well learn like what's something that yeah you've um you look back on and it's kind of shaped you a little bit or like it's something that you know you take a take off a grain of salt and you learn from well I remember last year I um I was in a course for Meteor Arts, and the course was Visual Effects Project. And it was run by a person who was on the spectrum. And I remember he's a very full-blown person. He's got a massive, like, his personality is very much out there. In many ways, he was actually kind of scary, <laughs> right? Like, he was, like, deadly serious one second, but then not very serious at all the next. On what, what spectrum, though? Um, oh, I never asked, and stuff like that. No, you mean autism, bi yeah. bipolar? Autism. Um, and so the person was, in many ways, he was a very extreme personality. Mm. Um, I ended up loving the fellow. Um, he, he ended up giving me a lot of very good advice in my life, and being an animator, and like being a lead, and telling people what to do, and stuff like that. Um, but I remember, he's... So, a, such an extreme personality on day one I didn't know how to respond to him so when he told me to get down on my knees and start drawing things on a piece of paper I said fuck you <laughs> why'd you say that what made you uh, I will I will admit what made me say that I was actually being kind of jokish about it but what I didn't fail to calculate was that he would have been taking that deadly seriously so he was this close to exploding and just hurling a bunch of abuse at me. But he t calmed down. This is incredibly admirable of him. He calmed down. So and he, then, did, he did yell at you? No, he didn't did. yell at me. He did, none of that happened. It was incredible. So he calmed down. And then after the lesson was over, he asked to speak, uh, speak to me in private. And he, t um, he just asked me, what was that about? And I just told him, well, that was, I guess that was just a character reaction of mine. Like, that was just... So, I felt like I was being pushed around or that uh, that was just how I was going to handle the situation. And he was like, I was nearly let loose. <laughs> nearly went mad. And so I guess um, I learned to be incredibly more sensitive with what I can say to people and stuff like that. And that what I say really does impact people. We don't realize it. Like, that our opinions and what we think and when we give people advice, they really do, like, take it. It really is powerful what we say to people. So... I guess what I learned there is that I gotta be careful like with what I say and I gotta realize that people people have feelings like I do. And um, sometimes you forget about that in a roller, crazy roller coaster of life. And then I learned a lot about leading people in that class. I got very emotional. Things like we had to make deadlines, like we had to do a lot of things we had to do an alien arm. People pulling all nighters and making models, mm. rigging things, like oh we had a beautiful alien rig that we made for that film. And like, I just learned to deal with people. Some people in my group got, like, had, like, you know, got very angry sometimes. And I had to learn to take them aside. And I found that usually when you speak to someone in private and you appear genuine, or at least you are genuine when you're talking to them, about, look, I have feelings as well. And I understand you're upset. Can we talk about this? And generally everything just calms down, like, as soon as you do that. So I tend to find that treat your other people like people talk to them talk to them about your problems hug it out um talk to them about how they're feeling about share your perspective and usually everything irons out and i found that that was something that i had to teach myself and something that i've been you know finding to be very true these days
you know, whenever there's been an issue on anything, I find that, or if I felt upset about what someone said, just going to speak to them and like personally and being like, look, this is, this is how I felt about what um, happened like 20 minutes ago. Can we like talk about it? And often it was sometimes a misunderstanding or, you know, so I find that, yeah, something that I've learned in my life is, yeah, talking to people and realize that the world, that you are not the center of the world. Yeah. I love the response your tutor had mm. in terms of, I feel if he just slashed out, yeah, he got, he gave into his, um, his primal his urge primal of rage. rage. Yeah. yeah he um, was. it's what separates us from the animals, right? A little bit, but if he gave into that primal carnalistic rage, I don't feel like you would have walked away with that lesson or yeah. like that more like life story, but him speaking to you after class, like, you know, I mm. feel like it hits you more. Yeah. I feel like you genuinely understand that, you know, he just, he was, yeah, as you said, he was probably very shocked and he was very, in a way, worried, I guess, and get, get had that reaction that you gave him. Yeah. Almost. Um, it's great. It's really great that, um, you, you know, and I feel like that that's a big lesson I think we all can learn. Yeah, um, I, it might be common sense for a lot of people, but for me, that's something I have It's, to learn, it's surprisingly know. not. Mm. Um, and I tell myself this every time, because, I mean, for my work, I work reception, I have to deal with so many different people. If yeah. the clients come in, they're a bit angry, they're a bit frustrated at their work. Yeah. It's so easy for me to just think in my head and pile up to comment, wow, what a, what a douche, or like, yeah. um, oh man, like that guy was a bit... Um, what a smart ass. It was like, smart. You know, yeah. But I really take a step back and... As soon as someone's angry, yeah, I I try to tell myself, okay, why could they be angry? Or like, what what? I mean, it could be anything. They could have had a bad day. They, I mean, this is really cliche, but mm. let's think about it. Their girlfriend could have broke up with them. <laughs> they could have they could have crashed their car that day. They yeah. could have um, they they could have found out that a loved one of theirs is going through a tough time in the hospital. Yeah, there's so many things. People people aren't just angry for the sake of it. Like there's a reason why people are angry in the yeah. world. Whether they don't know where they fit in, whether they're always late to things, whether they are always hungry or tired or stressed out, they hate their job. Yeah. If someone's angry, I I try to. I mean, I'm Catholic, so I, I generally try to say a prayer for them. Okay. I try to I pray for them and I hope they do well because I don't I don't think it's the right way to live to live in anger. Yeah. And I think you need to find joy in everything you try to do in life. Well, you know, that's, that's, yeah. that's, I mean, that's like a Christian value that I've learned is, okay. um, it's beyond happiness. It's finding joy through struggle okay. and, it's, and it's smiling through, it's smiling through adversity. Yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah. So when people are angry or frustrated or get angry at me, I do my absolute best to give, show them kindness, Yeah. you know, and, and, um, it's always worked. It's always worked in my favor whenever I've shown and I uh, so, so seek kindness. Wow. Well, there you go. Like, I can imagine sometimes it wouldn't work, and those those people, like, are assholes <laughs> who just who are just mad for the sake of being mad and just don't calm down. But I guess respond. even if it does, even if it doesn't work, it does because you still walk away with your head high. You yeah. Um, Be the better man. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also it's just the I think it's just the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, I read a, I read an interesting um story where this um. Uh, what's it called uh, uh, on the work tradie sites he was trying to get his men to wear hard hats yes and he would go up to them and they would always have their hard hat off and he would say to them put your hard hat on back on like yeah. do it now and yeah. they'll do it but every time he would leave they'll, they'll take, take it, it off. off and then he thought how can I get them to wear these hard hats What? why aren't they wearing it then he had a good think about it and he went up and he changed his whole approach he went up yeah. to them and said hey guys I want you to know I want you to wear the hard hats because I do really care about your safety. Yeah. Um, I don't want, you know, it's a very dangerous side we work on. I really don't want you guys to get hurt. Um, it's also just a regulation. It's mm. for you guys. Um, I, you know, it would mean a lot to me um, if you could keep your hard hats on at least while you're in that area. Yeah. I understand it's uncomfortable. If you want, I can try to look at changing the design of the hard hats so it's a bit better for you. Um, but it would, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah. And you know what? Apparently they never took their hard hats off again. <laughs> Didn't need that redesign. <laughs> so I mean, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, it's almost like just reframing and being honest about why you want to do certain things or why you're angry almost at someone. Like if you're angry at me, mm. I would want you to come to me and tell me, Jonty, like, 
instead of just yelling at me, yeah. which is what we so want to do. It's the easy option to do. It's why so many people do it. Yeah. But someone's taking a step back and thinking, John T, like, look, the reason why I'm angry is because this isn't this, and it makes me feel like this, and yeah. you know, moving forward, I would appreciate if we can come to an understanding. Mm. That's hard to do. It's very hard to do. I, I mean, I find it hard to do. I, I want to say I'm getting to a level where I can do it most of the time, but a lot of times, you know, yeah. I don't know. So, you know, like, it's an interesting perspective I once heard where if everything was good, then you wouldn't appreciate it as much. And I guess in, in terms of emotions, if you were yeah. happy all the time, well, are you really? <laughs> well, that's what I was going back to, I guess. Um, yeah, when there's time, there's, uh, people say this all the time, there's time for sorrow, there's yeah. time for joy, there's time for, there's time for celebration. So I guess um, when I was saying finding joy in everyday life, I guess mm. what I'm kind of saying is um, you should understand why you're sad at some point mm. and it's okay to feel that. It's good. Because when you understand what it's like to be sad, yeah, you you really are grateful and happy when when there's good times, mm. you know. Yeah, it's just a human thing. You never, yeah. And I guess the goal is, um, yeah. And I guess, yeah. You, I think you, I think you can't avoid being angry. Angry is a important emo- emotion to have. Yeah. I think the movie, um, uh, what's that movie where the girl has all the emotions in her head? Um, oh yeah, um, inside, inside out. out. Yeah, inside out. <laughs> Um, I think that showed a good thing on why it's important to have all. Yeah. Um, but then it's also, yeah, it's important to understand that, you know, you should have, yeah, you need to learn emotional intelligence. Mm. And in ter- and emotional intelligence is just like, when you say, as soon as you start getting angry, yeah, it's like, okay, why am I feeling angry now? Yeah. Asking yourself that and asking, okay, I'm angry because of this. What am I going to do about it? Mm. Yeah. It's like, you know, a thorn in your backside. Why? <laughs> Why? I don't know how we. Happen? I don't know how we got to this conversation. Well, you asked. You asked me. Uh, what's something in my life that I've been yeah, thinking about? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. So yeah, that's how we got to it, which is I think really cool. <laughs> but yeah, so that's just something I've been working on in my life. Um, other than that, just trying to stay organized. You know, yeah. That is uh, the eternal struggle, I think, for any artist or any self-made person, isn't it? You know, if you have to give. Um, some advice to someone starting out in VFX or someone, you know, doing projects like you or or something I guess you want to just let people know or people in going through the same stuff as you, their daily emotions. Or something I guess, you know, you'd like to say to people listening to this. <sighs> so if you're just starting out in animation, like you can start basically with just a camera and a piece of paper. And you can start like doing how they did in the old style by flipping things and stuff and drawing and then flipping and tracing. Like today with the technology we have and the easy access to everything, there's almost no excuse to just continue watching videos. You can open up an animation program. You can open up like, I remember there was a program called Pivot. Like mm-hmm. it was in every like um, primary school computer. Yeah. You can animate on that thing. I remember spending sometimes entire lunches animating like a fight scene with stick figures wow. and pivot <laughs> and like you like you could probably do some pretty good things with pivot to be honest um learn all about walk cycles and stuff like that but um and if someone's going through like a bit of a rough part in their vfx and their work what's something that, that got you through it as such like i feel like you know getting you through a project or every through... every frame is a goal um, I remember I did a painting recently that had triangles in it and had like every triangle was a block of color and there were like a 300 different triangles. So I'd have to go through the process of painting every triangle. And I just kept telling myself it was like 3 a.m. in the morning. Got to hand this painting in like at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Every triangle is a goal. So I guess when you look at it, every frame is a goal. Every shot is a goal. And then slowly but surely things just bloom out. And you suddenly, you have a finished, you know, a finished shot, a finished film. Every, you know, like, a journey for a thousand miles, what takes the first, uh, begins with a first step. So, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I feel your pain. Hundreds have uh, felt your pain. Uh, crunch is a terrible thing, and it's real. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, I feel sorry for you, but don't worry. Um, I've been there with you, buddy. Uh, we've all been there. 
So I guess just be rest assured in knowing that uh, you are not alone. And I guess what uh, makes a difference between you succeeding and not is entirely your attitude and uh, making sure that you uh, get it done. Don't give up on it. Uh, you'll get it done. And when it's done, you'll be so happy. You, people will be so impressed with you. Like, wow, you did that. And you'll be like, oh, is it really that good? And they'll be like, yeah, man, it's really that good. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm happy with myself. And I encourage people watching this podcast to, I'm going to link to how you can contact Delaney. If you have any questions about VFX or if you want just to watch your VFX work you've done, let's yeah. chat to him a bit more. Yeah. I'll give him your email, Delaney, or just thank you. something in your podcast. Oh, notes. thanks very much. Yeah. Dude, it was super fun doing this. Oh, thank you. We this could is... talk for hours more. Yeah, we, we. I think we <laughs> honestly can talk. How long have we been going for? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't even, I, I don't have any clock. I need someone just to like oh, give me an alarm. I don't something. think you need a clock. <laughs> if you put a clock down, people will, you'll start being like, oh, it's been an hour. We'll be better wrap this up, you know? <laughs> Dude, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you for uh, hosting me. This has been fun. Um, I was a bit nervous uh, coming on at first, but that, you can get into it pretty quickly. Actually, this is this is great. I hope I hope things I said today uh, made sense uh, and <laughs> stuff like that. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Nah, it's all good. Thanks, man. Thanks, mate. Uh, thank you very much.